Hi, boys and girls. It's Miss Stacy back with Chapter 7 of Hudson Taylor. Today's chapter is called, Were You to Remain in England? Back in Barnsley, Hudson made a quick recovery. The house was warm, the food wholesome, and his mother fussed over him constantly, especially after she found out about his eating habits in London. Amelia and Mary Ann were also frequent visitors to the house, and their laughter and conversation cheered him. On one of these visits, Hudson finally plucked up the courage to ask Marianne to marry him. He was excited when she agreed, and her father gave his permission. Marianne would be his companion in China after all. After several weeks at home, Hudson received news that his cousin Tom in London was sick with rheumatic fever. Since Tom had cared for him when he was sick with malignant fever, Hudson thought it was time to return the favor, so he traveled back to London. As he sat through the nights caring for Tom, he continually prayed for God to provide a way for him to get to China sooner rather than later. Unknown to Hudson, as he stood watch beside Tom's bed, things were happening in China. Since 1644, China had been ruled by an emperor and governing officials who were Manchu people from northeastern China. The Manchu emperor and his government were known as the Qing Dynasty. But even though outsiders thought everyone in the China was the same, the Chinese people regarded the Manchus as alien outsiders. Of course, this didn't really worry the Qing dynasty. They had been in power for a long, long time, and they had more than enough troops to keep things that way, or so they thought. In central China, a long way from Peking, the Qing dynasty's capital, a rebellion had begun, and it was getting better, bigger with each passing day. The rebellion was known as the Taiping Rebellion, and those fighting in the rebellion were fighting to overthrow the Qing Dynasty. Su the Taipings had control of much of central China, including the old capital of Nanking. But more important for Europeans than how much territory the Taipings control was what their leaders thought about white people. While they wanted the English to stop importing opium into China, the Taipings did not believe that white people were barbarians, as many Chinese people did. Instead, they believed that all men were brothers and that rather than being out of the interior of China, white people should be allowed to go where they wished and meet with whomever they wanted. News of the rebellion slowly drifted back to England and Hudson first read about it in the Gleaner, the newsletter of the Chinese Evangel Evangelization Society. He was excited by what he read, but he was also very busy. While taking care of Tom, he had once again run out of money. This time, though, he felt God had a different plan to meet his needs than before. And sure enough, as Hudson prayed about the situation, Dr. Brown from the Bishopsgate area of London offered him a job as his assistant. Not only that, Dr. Brown offered to adjust the hours Hudson worked so that he could, could continue his medical studies at London Hospital. Hudson eagerly accepted the position, and since Tom was well enough, he moved in with Dr. Brown and his wife. Soon Hudson's days were full. After attending classes at the hospital from 8 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon, it was back to Bishopsgate where he assisted Dr. Brown dispensing medicine, visiting patients, and keeping the doctor's accounts. Hudson, When he had finished helping Dr. Brown in the evening, Hudson prayed, studied the Bible, poured over his medical books, and practiced writing Chinese pictographs late in the night. The days were long, but Mrs. Brown's wonderful cooking seemed to give Hudson the energy he needed to keep going. Marianne made trips to London to visit Hudson, but with each trip, he couldn't help noticing that Marianne did not seem to share his enthusiasm. She always had a reason for why she could not stay longer. Finally, after several weeks, he confronted her about it, and she confessed that she did love him, but her mother was very ill, and her father had never really approved their, of their engagement. Hudson was shocked. Her father had personally given them permission to marry. Immediately, he wrote to Mr. Vaughn to set things straight. Mr. Bon Vaughn responded very straightforwardly, though not as Hudson wanted or expected. His letter said, Were you to remain in England, nothing would give me more pleasure than to see you happily married to Marianne. But though I do not forbid your connection, I feel I can never willingly give her up or ever think of her leaving this country. At first, Hudson felt angry at Mr. Vaughn. Why did he say yes to the marriage in the first place? Why didn't he say what he really felt in the beginning? But the more he thought about it, the more he could sympathize with the way Mr. Vaughn felt. Over and over in his mind, he played an imaginary conversation with Mr. Vaughn. The conversation went like this. Mr. Vaughn, where are you going to live once you are married? Hudson said, China. 
Mr. Vaughn, what part of China? After all, China is a very big country. Hudson said, I don't know yet. God hasn't shown me, but I believe it will be some place in the interior, somewhere where foreigners have never been. Mr. Vaughn, what means of support will you have? Hudson said, the Chinese Evangelization Society might send me out, but I have not fully decided to take up their offer, nor are they financially stable. In short, we will go with nothing except what God supplies. Mr. Vaughn, how often will you bring Mary Ann home to visit her family? Hudson said, I can't promise you'll, you that you'll ever see her again. When Hudson thought about things this way, it was easy to see why Mr. Vaughn was not eager for them to marry. But he loved Mary Ann. He was convinced she would make a wonderful wife. Of course, he could always not go to China. Mary Ann was always telling him that he could help many people at home in England as a doctor. Yet as much as he loved Mary Ann, he loved God more, and God had called him to China with or without a wife. There was nothing left to do but end the engagement. Although he was depressed over the breakup with Mary Ann, he was excited by the stories of the Taiping Rebellion that continued to be reported in the Gleaner. There was great optimism among churches and missionary societies that this could be the break they were all looking for, the break that would once and, once and for all let missionaries penetrate into inland China. With his head full of the events taking place in China, Hudson sometimes found it hard to focus on his medical studies. It was at this time a major thought occurred to him. Yes, he loved medicine and the idea of being a doctor, but medical knowledge was simply a tool. He was called to be an evangelist, and if his medical training helped him to evangelize more effectively, then well and good. But one thing was for sure, he knew he wasn't called to China to just start a hospital in one of the treaty ports. He was called to evangelize inland China, and now the Taiping Rebellion seemed to be providing a wonderful opportunity to finally get to where he knew he was called, deep into the very heart of China. So why should he continue on with his medical training when it was training him to be something he knew God hadn't called him to be? Now it was time for him to be on his way to China. At the same time that Hudson was having these thoughts, the Chinese Evangelization Society decided that the present opportunity in China was too good to miss. They decided to send two missionaries there immediately. When the society found out that Hudson Taylor was available, they soon decided that he should be the first to go. The Chinese Evangelization Society would pay for his trip to China and would send him money each month to meet his living expenses. He would go first to Shanghai and wait there until opportunities opened for him to move farther inland. Hudson was delighted. The Chinese Evangelization Society booked him passage to China on the Dumfries, a two-masted sailing ship leaving from Liverpool on September 19th, headed for Shanghai. Hudson quickly set about gathering the supplies he needed to take with him. Finally, several days before the Dumfries was due to sail, he arrived in Liverpool where his family was waiting for him. Mr. Pierce from the Chinese Evangelization Society also joined them, as did Aunt Hannah. They all spent several wonderful days together. Finally, September 19, 1853 arrived. The crew was just stowing the last of the cargo when Hudson arrived at the dock. Hudson went aboard and the steward showed him to his cabin in the stern of the ship. The cabin had been freshly, freshly painted in honor of the only passenger of the trip. His family, Mr. Pierce, and a local minister all accompanied him to his cabin, where they prayed and read psalms together. Finally, they had to leave the ship as it was about to set sail. Hudson hugged his mother one last time, and when she was safely back on the dock, the mooring ropes were let go, and the Dumfries slid away from the dock out into the Mercy River. Captain Morris gave the order to hoist the sails, and as the wind caught them, the ship began the three-mile the trip down the Mercy to the Irish Sea. Hudson waved as hard as he could at his family on the dock, and as they began to fade from sight, he climbed into the rigging in hopes of getting one last look. He was 21 years old and on his way to China at last. Four days out from Liverpool, the Dumfries ran into the fierce storm that nearly wrecked it and its crew on the rocks of the Welsh coast. It took Captain Morris and his crew nearly two weeks to repair all the damage done to the ship by the storm. Some of the crew had been injured in the storm, and Hudson was able to tend to their wounds. Finally, with all the damage repaired, the ship was able to get back under full sail as she headed down the west coast of Africa. After the excitement of the storm in the Irish Sea had passed, the voyage soon became monotonous. At Christmas time, three months after leaving Liverpool, the ship reached the southernmost point on her voyage, the Cape of Good Hope. The Dumfries log showed that the ship had traveled 14,500 miles so far, but there was still a long way to go before she reached China. 
By early January 1854, the Dumfries had begun the long haul across the Indian Ocean. She passed 120 miles off the northwestern tip of Australia and headed out among the tropical islands of the western Pacific Ocean for the last slow leg of her voyage to Shanghai. Occasionally, she came close enough to an island for the inhabitants to paddle out to the ship to offer coconuts and shells in exchange for knives and blankets. Days and nights in the tropics settled into a pattern. During the day, the sea was calm and there was no wind, so the sailors would play cards, carve scrimshaw, and entertain each other with the stories of what they would do when they got ashore. Occasionally, one of them would slip away from the group and stop by Hudson's cabin. His door was always open, and he had many interesting discussions with crew members about aspects of the Sunday services he held on the dock. At sunset, the wind usually began to blow. If they were lucky, it would continue blowing until dawn. Some nights, though, the wind didn't come at all. On those nights, the Dumfries covered less than seven miles. Captain Morris faithfully entered the distance covered each day into the ship's log. If their journey had become with, begun with near disaster because of the overactivity of the wind and waves, it nearly end, it ended in disaster for the exact opposite reason. It was Sunday, and Hudson was holding his regular service on the aft deck of the Dumfries. Many crewmen sat around on barrels and coils of rope, listening as he preached, but Captain Morris didn't, didn't seem to be paying attention to the service. This was unusual. The captain was a Methodist and thoroughly enjoyed having a young missionary aboard his ship. After the final hymn was sung, the captain walked to the side of the ship and peered worriedly into the water. Hudson joined him and asked what he was looking for. The answer was not comforting. They were becalmed and headed for disaster. The current was stronger than usual, about four knots, and it was carrying them towards a sunken reef. With no wind expected until nightfall, Captain Morris feared it would be too late and the Dumfries would hit the reef and sink before them. This information sent shudders up Hudson's spine. He had seen many sharks around the ship the past few days, and he did not like the thought of having to swim for his life. Be calmed is one word that strikes fear into the hearts of men on sailing ships. A storm, even a hurricane, can often be outrun, but a be calmed ship goes wherever the current takes it, and there is nothing that can be done about it. In the Irish Sea, the Dumfries had nearly been lost because of too much wind. Now it seemed she would be lost because of too little wind. It was a desperate situation, and even though Captain Morris knew that nothing could be done about the wind, his crew begged him to let them try something. So he allowed them to put to sea in the longboats. They connected heavy ropes from the Dumfries to the longboats, and they strained at the oars, trying to row the ship against the current, but she would not be swayed and continued to drift. Silently, the crew climbed the rope net back on board the Dumfries. Their best efforts had done no good. It was hopeless. By the time the evening breeze came, it would be far too late for the ship and her crew. How strange to meet death on such a calm and beautiful day, Hudson thought, as he peered over the side of the Dumfries. Then Captain Morris broke into his thoughts. We've done everything we can, he said. We can only wait and see what happens next. The captain's words echoed in Hudson's head. We've done everything we can. But had they? An idea came to him. Enthusiastically, he turned to Captain Morris and said, There is one thing we have not done yet. And what is that? asked the captain, surprised that Hudson would think he knew something about rescuing becalmed ships. Four of us on board are Christians. Let's each go to his own cabin and agree together to pray and ask God to give us wind right away. He can just as easily send it now as at sunset. Captain Morris agreed since no one but God could help them now. He hurried off to his cabin while Hudson located the ship's Swedish carpenter and the steward, the other two Christians aboard. In his cabin, Hudson prayed hard for a few minutes and then felt as though some burden had been lifted from him. He was confident that God had heard their prayers and would answer them. Getting up off his knees, he strode back up on deck. The first officer was standing, smoking a pipe on the foredeck. Hurry, let the mainsail down all the way, Hudson told him. The first officer sneered at him. What would be the point of that? The Christians on board have been praying for wind, and it will come any moment now. I suggest you get ready for it. The first officer laughed heartily. A young missionary was telling them how to run a ship. There would be no wind until sunset, and to make his point, he turned toward the sail. Did it flutter a little? Perhaps, but a flutter would do them no good. At the, as the first officer stood there, a much stronger gust of wind swept across the ship. This time he wasted no time. All hands on deck, he yelled as he grabbed hold of one of the halyards. The crew came running, and not far behind them was Captain Morris, who had heard all the commotion from his cabin. 
It was a wonderful strong breeze that blew. Within minutes, the Dumfries was plowing through the Pacific Ocean at seven knots. Each minute that passed took them farther away from the dangerous reef and closer to Shanghai. Well, next time in Chapter 8, Hudson makes it to China. See you then.